Welcome everybody. I'm here at Clem Clinic. Uh, we're uh, just finished ground rounds with Dr. Josh Korsnick, who's the director of the Center for Crohn's and Colitis at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. He's been a researcher for decades in this, has published over 60 articles, and is really pioneering new ways of thinking about IBD. And I'm just so excited to have you here at Clem Clinic and to share some of your wisdom and insights. Thank you. Delighted to be here. It's great, great to spend more time with you and to see this place and, and what you're doing. It's really great. So, you know, typically in IBD treatments, it's about suppressing the immune system, but you've taken a different look looking at the microbiome and the role of bacteria, the byproducts they produce, and how they affect Crohn's and colitis, particularly things like hydrogen sulfide, which is a bacterial byproduct, and how that damages mitochondria and how it leads to activation of the inflammasome, driving this sort of cascade. And you're trying to sort of work on it upstream by addressing the the microbiome in unique ways. So can you talk about some of the research you're doing in that yeah, area? Yeah, so and work? I think that there's, there's uh, we think the microbiome influences these diseases in a couple different ways. So in terms of ulcerative colitis, the underlying driver uh, is not primarily that the bacteria cause an, an increase in inflammation just the way an infectious disease might. <clears throat> we think that there are products that they're doing. So the question is really what's, what's detrimental about what they're doing? And with ulcerative colitis, it's long been recognized that there's been an association, particularly with flares, of a group of bacteria that produce hydrogen sulfide. So hydrogen sulfide is used by the body in many compartments as a benefit. But when it's outside those compartments, when it's in the lumen of the intestine, and it becomes what's called dissimulatory hydrogen sulfide, it can be injurious. So it causes injury to the mitochondria. And it's curious, because even though the mitochondria has hydrogen sulfide in it, it gets overwhelmed and it causes uh, dysfunction, which causes an activation of the inflammasome. So the whole inflammatory process gets directly activated, as well as generation of a lot of superoxide uh, radicals. So, we think. Do you guys clear about how the uh, mitochondrial injury causes activation of the inflammasome? So uh, it's not so much our work directly, but other people uh, are looking at some of the pathways that it activates it through signaling uh, of, uh, of that more so directly. The reactive oxygen species? So it's reactive oxygen species, but they're separate pathways as well that seem to do that. So the pathway seems to be that the bacteria degrade the mucin. So mucin should be a nice barrier there to protect the bacteria from getting too close to the lining of the intestine. Um, that barrier gets eroded and is thinner in ulcerative colitis. And they've done interesting studies where they've taken radio-labeled pig mucin, mixed that in with stool of patients with ulcerative colitis, and patients with ulcerative colitis degrade that mucin more avidly. So the first step is degradation of mucin, which in itself probably can stimulate inflammation. The second step, though, is that mucin uh, heavily contains cysteine, which is a precursor for hydrogen sulfide. So it may be exogenous sulfur, uh, and <clears throat> so it's not eating uh, garlic and onions and so it may be broccoli. different forms. No, but it may be that red meat provides more uh, sulfur, and that that's a different pathway because it, it may be the form that it comes in, mm -hmm. and also some of us, I think, our diet currently has much more sulfur than it used to be. So some of us have sulfur pumps to sort of capture it, so less of it gets down to the colon. Mm -hmm. And then it gets more complicated because it's, we have some bacteria that produce hydrogen sulfide and some bacteria that degrade hydrogen sulfide. So it's probably a balance of, of several things. It's how much hydrogen sulfide you're producing, how much hydrogen sulfide your, your other bacteria are breaking down. And then we do have enzymes in the lining of our colon to protect us from this. Mm -hmm. And other bacteria produce uh, toxins. So uh, uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa makes something called HQNO, which is a inhibitor of one of the enzymes. Mm -hmm. And some people with, say, IBS, it hasn't been looked at as much in IBD, in their small bowel have as much as, one study, I think this may have been off at 97%, but but 40, 50, 60% of people have, may have their small bowel colonized with Pseudomonas, which produces this HQNO. So we're looking to see, is that increased? So certainly, say, with people with cystic fibrosis, it's been shown that they have an increase in this HQNO, and that may be a critical step because it may be impairing these enzymes. So is, 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 is it correct to think that maybe there's a continuum between IBS and IBD? 
That, uh, well, I think there may be a continuum in terms of some of the in processes words, that go some on. Of the, some of the literature I read recently suggests that IBS might be also inflammatory. That's right. So it's, it's in a much smaller context, though. Or let's say the inflammation isn't as overt. And, but yes, yeah, so that there's some suggestion that IBS on a much more sort of uh, biochemical level may, may have an inflammatory response. So is it the disturbance in the microbiome? in the balance of the different bacteria that drive, you know, this cascade to production of more hydrogen sulfide? And if we sort of figured that out, could we shift? You mentioned that bacteroides is I, actually increased and bifidobacter is decreased right. in IBD patients. Right. Right. So the question is, what are all these doing and how do they interact? And that it's, it's so the first thing is trying to understand what's increased, what's decreased. Second is understanding what they're doing. And I think many of us have bacteria that do some of these things, but I think it's just people who have all of these things collide because it's only maybe about 0.5% uh, of the population that have Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Many people have some of these dysbioses, so they might have bacteria that degrade mucin, they may have hydrogen sulfide production, uh, but I think you need to have this unfortunate collision of, of these three different things happening together. Can we change the microbiome? So it's, it's harder to do than we thought. Mm -hmm. Taking probiotics add things there, but it doesn't necessarily change the underlying makeup. Some do, but you know, when we take, as you know, we take, we go to the health food store, it's five billion, 10 billion, it sounds like a whopping number, but a gram of stool, which isn't much, has 100 or 200 billion bacteria. Yeah. And a lot of that isn't living, a lot of it's gotta get through the acid and the bile and into this hostile environment. So. So how to change it, you've got the issues now of the biofilm, and, and when you do, say, have a colonoscopy or take a bunch of bacteria of antibiotics, as you know, it snaps right back to where it was once those, those sort of perturbations are, are gone. So you've got like a garden with a number of different sort of plants, and it just always goes back to those species is what you're exactly. saying, no matter what you do. Right. Except for fecal transplants, maybe. So fecal transplants, certainly when we've, we've done a study with Beth Israel looking at fecal transplants in Crohn's, initially the studies were sort of one-time fecal transplants. Uh, for C. difficile, that can be very effective, but for Crohn's and for ulcerative colitis, these chronic inflammatory conditions, we probably need to give them routinely. So we give one uh, big dose, and then it's orally a uh, number of capsules once a week is the current standard. Some of the, there's then the question of what How we call How is that working? So it's mixed. Some of the studies have been statistically significant. The benefit over placebo, 10, 15%. So it's not, I think we had the hope. Not a home run. No, and we had the hope this was going to be a cure. And I think everybody thought, great, that's the thing. Just change it and boom, you're good to go. So it's complicated. And, and how to do that and what, how to prepare the colon for the, for the new stool and how to make it so it takes. It's hard because the inflammatory process affects that. Um, what you eat affects that, mm -hmm. uh, your immune system does, other medications affect that, uh, even things like artificial sweeteners affect that, mm -hmm. um, sugar affects it. So, <clears throat> and then there may be super donors as they're called. So certain people who's... who's power poop. Power poop, <laughs> that's got the good stuff. Uh, you know, there's gold in that <laughs> poop. Yeah, exactly. So some people... We, right now what we're doing is, is kind of crazy because we don't know what the defect is yeah. and we don't know what the benefit is. Mm -hmm. And we're saying, let's just throw this all together and hope for the best and, and see if and it there's works. there's no like sort of characteristics of the microbiome in UC or Crohn's patients that you can map out and say, oh, this is a tendency so a pattern? Th there are. So there are. So certainly in terms of probiotics, people are looking for a probiotic that is a butyrate producer. So butyrate as the primary fuel, it's a short chain fatty acid, the primary fuel for the cells that line the colon, mm -hmm. um, has critical effects on mucin, on the immune system, on cell functioning in the colon. And the bacteria in the colon uh, in patients with ulcerative colitis tend to have much lower butyrate. Um, so what are the butyrate producing bacteria that you'd want to get? So it's not entirely clear. So bifidobacteria is probably a butyrate producer, lactobacillus I think, but maybe a little less. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of others that are being looked at. But the question is, can they survive in that environment? What are those other factors there that 
help them grow or not grow. Mm -hmm. So complex carbohydrates are an important growth factor for bifidobacteria. Yeah, high fiber. <clears throat> it's high fiber. There are things like fructooligosaccharides, inulin, other things that are not digested in the small bowel. So they go into the colon. They're the preferred fuel, and they help some of those bacteria grow and sustain themselves. The problem is that if you try them, they produce a lot of gas. Mm -hmm. Now, if you start slowly and ramp it up, sometimes people tolerate that better. Uh, typically, people can get to 8 to 10 grams a day, but I've tried them myself. And you feel like you're a balloon, sort yeah. of, uh, that just... I mean, and maybe that's because of the dysbiotic bacteria that are preferentially... And I, I, think those it, you. I think we're also probably, my guess is, is that 10,000 years ago, we produced a lot more gas than we do today. Mm. And that that sort of a... And we probably dealt with it differently, and not just socially, Living I mean. In caves. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, you're out there, so people... <laughs> What was el elsewhere in the cave probably smelled worse, but <laughs> but but uh, it's a it's a different. I think we had a very, it was a very different environment, mm -hmm. and um, and I think also our our gut bacteria, our body adjusted to those other uh, other sort of gases that the bacteria are putting out. You know, it's fascinating. I've looked at some some folks who were really exploring the microbiome, and there's some kind of crazy people out there who are radically changing their diet and following their microbiome in a serial pattern. And they literally can, you know, if they change from a, you know, vegan diet to a caveman diet or paleo diet, they see dramatic changes in the communities of microbes right. in there that seems like a way to shift it. So clearly the food you're eating is driving the pattern of the bacteria in your gut. So how, how is that So that is such role? an important point because the orthodoxy in GI was that soon after birth, after you're weaned, your bacteria are set, and that's what you've got for life, and you can't change it. And that's obviously wrong. And in fact, when they've done studies in mice, but in people as well, changing a diet can make a change in the gut flora in a matter of days. Yeah. And it's not as if this is fixed. So people, when we, we did a study of twins in their stool and looking at the microbiome and suggesting that their important environmental components is not, yes, genetics played a small role in how similar their microbiome was, but most of those twins are living, lived together for their childhood. And so, but yes, you can make it a huge impact on your microbiome in a very short period of time. And it's understanding some of what what those components in our diet affected. So you know, I mentioned some of the artificial sweeteners. There was an interesting study suggesting that the um, that one of the artificial sweeteners, I'm trying to remember which one it was, enhanced the growth of the particularly toxic C. difficile that's been grow coming recently. So something that we don't think of as being, you know, something that's going to have such a dramatic effect on the microbiome. Mm -hmm seems to maybe one of the factors that explained this development of the sort of uh, super toxic uh, C. difficile that's been... Uh, Fascinating. You know, I, had a, I had a conversation with the vice chairman of Pepsi a few weeks mm. ago. Yeah, how'd that go? And uh -huh. we were actually, you know, we were kind of very friendly because I've uh -huh. seen him around for the years and we yeah. kind of go back and forth and, you know, he, he, interesting, they're, they're trying to figure out solutions to things. I saw they have a new organic Gatorade, which was fascinating with regular sugar, but it had 30 grams of sugar, which is like seven or eight teaspoons. Yeah, right. <laughs> but anyway, he, you know, we were talking about the microbiome and, and artificial sweeteners, and he said, well, he said, well, these are digested in the gut. You know, this is a, you know, peptide, aspartame, and it's broken down, so there's no way it can have an effect. And I was standing in this conference, and right next to me was Rob Knight, who's one of the yeah. premier microbiome scientists. Right. I said, Rob, come over here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we had an interesting debate about it. But yeah. I think the evidence is interesting that there's so many different things uh, in terms of our diet and, and, and products in our diet that we're not even aware of that can affect all of those things. Like uh, some of the, the thickeners seem to affect the gut lining and impermeability issues like carrageenan and xanthan gum and things that are in a lot of health food products. Right. You know. So, and particularly uh, some of the emulsifiers. Right. So it's really interesting in terms of ulcerative colitis, there's been some work done in animal studies, very interesting stuff, looking at some of the emulsifiers. So polysorbate 80, uh, some of the other things. And in the mice that were given that, that incited an inflammatory uh, process in the GI tract of the mice. So just low levels of these emulsifiers. Um, now, why, how they're working, what they're doing, is it working through the microbiome, is it working on the mucin, is it doing other things? We're not sure, but it's been suggested that, that those 
elements uh, may have an important effect on, on inflammation. And then it's also the issue of increasing permeability, even aside from a GI-specific disease of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, is this affecting permeability otherwise by, because low level of inflammation increases permeability. And so is that the beginning of other diseases as well? Yeah. So yeah. that is fascinating to look at, you know, food components. Right. Most GI docs, I mean, I saw Crohn's patients yesterday and they said, my doctor told me there's no connection between food and... Right. And I said, well, just logically, if you're eating pounds of a substance every day and putting it right. in this tube that you're an expert in, why wouldn't you think it would have an right. impact? It's, it, it is amazing that, firstly, that it's taken us this long to recognize the microbiome is important. When, you know, what's sitting right there next to the mucosa and, you know, same thing, diet... I think many GI docs are now coming around to the view at least that it's important, but still the typical line is it's not important or, yeah, if it hurts when you go like this, then don't go like that. So if it hurts when you eat chocolate, don't eat chocolate. But right. it's obviously more complicated than that. And, and it's also hard because it's sort of the food component. So something like the FODMAP diet, so looking at, at sort of broad categories may be important because you may be able to take the, in a tiny bit of lactose but if you have more, you'll get more symptoms, and it may be it outstrips your capacity to deal with things. So, Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, the food issue in functional medicine is something we really focus on is a primary therapy for autoimmune yeah. disease and inflammatory disease. And so it's interesting, you know, when you look at those conditions, they're really heterogeneous. And so what might work for one won't work for another, and right. there might be multiple etiologies for the same disease in different patients. Right. So it becomes very confusing for people to figure out how to navigate toward the ideology, which is what we're trying to do. And I think the issue of the diet is, is often a simple intervention that can have profound effects. And what is the sort of standard now in terms of Crohn's and colitis? What are IBD docs telling patients to eat or not eat? So uh, the gen I think nutrition is neglected, but it's beginning to come into it, really in part because patients are saying, this is important. <laughs> so how... How is it important? And we don't have good answers. Um, we uh, really encourage experimentation. So we want, we work with patients to try whether it's, you know, gluten-free is probably helpful for a subgroup of patients. Gluten-free and dairy-free, some people get a benefit from that. Uh, is it really impacting the core of the inflammatory process? We're not sure. I think that a, there's some data for more of a plant-based vegan kind of diet, and so we're looking at that. There is a study that's about, or that I think has been started uh, in Crohn's looking at the specific carbohydrate diet. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a... Just removing fermentable sugars, essentially, right? Right. It's a pretty, I mean, it's become very much an orthodox diet of what's legal and illegal. Uh, Barbara Olensky out at University of Massachusetts has done a good job of creating a more patient-friendly sort of autoimmune anti-inflammatory diet that has been looks very promising for, uh, for Crohn's disease. What they're doing in this other study is that they're actually providing the diet for the first six weeks, and then you continue it on your own for the next six weeks. Um, <clears throat> and I think they're uh, doing is a Mediterranean diet versus that and randomizing people. And is that you know, the autoimmune paleo diet, or is it the vegan so diet? So that's a specific or? carbohydrate diet. Specific carbohydrate diet, right. yeah. Um, and so, and we're looking at those as well. We're going to do a, just a pilot study initially in something called primary sclerosis and cholangitis, so liver disease that affects it, of looking at vegan versus mm -hmm. specific carbohydrate diet, just to get some preliminary data. So what's really recommended? I would say that uh, not much is really recommended. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've got like all the ways that food can affect things from the microbiome to the biofilm to the permeability issues, this whole cascade. Right. And so, you know, in functional medicine, we typically use what we call an elimination diet, which is eliminating the common food triggers, which is gluten, dairy yeah. as a primary, and then there may be others, soy, eggs, or corn. Uh, some folks look at grains and beans as factors. And the whole issue of lectins is becoming, you know, this hot topic. Some of the top selling books are on it. And the question is, you know, What's your perspective on the role of lectins as a trigger for inflammation in the gut, particularly in these compromised patients? Right. So I would say I don't have a, I don't have a good knowledge base, I would say, to really comment on that well. <clears throat> I would say that um, diet is, uh, I think the things that are, are probably the, the biggest changes are one is, and I, it, probably in the Midwest here you've got big meat eaters. 
And so cutting back, I think, on meat is a critical thing, and there's been more uh, data with that. I think a vegan diet for people who can or are willing is, is critical. I think what components of the... Um, of fruits and vegetables are helpful or harmful, that's tougher. <clears throat> Whether lectins are harmful by binding to certain things uh, or harmful by causing other sort of detrimental effects is unclear, uh, at least to me. I don't think it's been looked that well at. When we've done these food frequency questionnaires uh, and looking at big numbers, we haven't found as much as we thought we might. I did a study in India because it, IBD used to be very rare in India, now it's relatively common, and so diet would seem to be an obvious kind of thing. And we figured, all right, so it's probably something about the Western diet that people are adopting. Well, nobody was on a Western diet, so it's not that. But I think people are preparing their foods differently. Um, but we couldn't pick out any... So the oils are different. You mentioned that omega-6 fatty right. acids may trigger inflammation That's and are linked right. to IBD. So. I think they're using a lot more refined oils instead of ghee and traditional fats and coconut. Right, right. And so I think they're, they're sort of some of the things they're eating may be technically the same, but they're prepared foods as opposed to preparing them from raw ingredients at home. But we weren't able to really sort of tease that out as, as critical components in our study so far. It almost seems like you need a multimodal approach to addressing you know, Absolutely. these factors. Absolutely. No, I agree entirely. And our approach generally in medicine is one thing, one thing and this is going to be, and, and trying to make it as specific as possible. Right. So we have an antibody that binds just to this, and that's going to take care of the problem. And I always say we need to sort of replace Occam's razor with Charlotte's Whip. <laughs> that's a good way of putting it. Yes, and it's, it's a complex disease that has lots of factors that, that come into it. And particularly in this stage where we don't understand what causes the diseases. So it's one thing if we understood that the reason why you have a pain is a knife in your back and we're going to pull out that knife. We don't understand that. And so we want to bring in as many different things as possible. And we use a you know, variety of approaches, both in terms of, of whether it's diet, whether it's lifestyle modifications, whether it is psychosocial interventions otherwise, and a variety of medical approaches. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's good data in ulcerative colitis for, say, uh, curcumin mm -hmm. uh, at a higher dose, 1.5 grams twice a day, um, in a good randomized controlled trial that showed a benefit in ulcerative colitis that was pretty uh, impressive. I mean, that's generally the approach from functional medicine. We look at all these components and yeah. we go, okay, how do we work on diet and right. the right, you know, phytochemicals and yeah. probiotics? And, so know. I think there's tremendous interest, and I think, I think you're doing it Formally, I think a lot of people are trying to do it and aren't calling it functional medicine, yeah. uh, but are sort of approaching that in different ways. And I think giving it a, a name and a more formalized mm -hmm. approach is really helpful. So I want to sort of take a little change of tack. Mm -hmm. I could talk about hydrogen sulfide and mitochondria mm -hmm. all day, but you know, you mentioned to me before that you were looking at various roles of toxins in IBD. For right. example, acrylamide, which is from deep frying French fries and other right. things, or a smelter community where right people had clusters of IBD, and you were looking at various factors that relate to that. Can you talk a little bit about the role yeah, of toxins? So, <clears throat> so this is speculative. We don't know. Uh, we started working uh, with some people at the Harvard School of Public Health, and it's, it's frightening because there are about 10,000 chemicals that we're exposed to routinely that can probably be measured in our blood or in other sort of body compartments that we're not aware of. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're interested in trying to understand which of those might be involved in inflammatory bowel disease. So I always th think of these shirts that you throw into the dryer, they come out and they're pressed and it's a miracle. And that's because of formaldehyde, which is a carcinogen. I'm not saying that has anything to do with that. My mother taught me how to iron. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, it's sort of meditative. Uh, but um, so I don't know if, so we, I think that they're important environmental toxins. We don't know which. So. We were approached by a group in Northport, Washington, um, where they said they had about 50 out of 350 people had IBD. We sent a group out there. We couldn't get records from many people. We could get 17 out of 350 that we could verify had IBD, most had ulcerative colitis. And so we think that that was, clearly there's something going on. And interestingly, they're 10, 15 miles south of the Canadian border, right next to a smelter. 
So they're getting all sorts of things coming down. Now it's been increasingly cleaned up, uh, but they still have all sorts of stuff coming Lead down. Lead and mercury. Lead, mercury, arsenic, other things. So we're looking into that both in that population and just a small subset. And then we're looking at a new onset IBD in kids and looking to see if they're, uh, they have any increased in, in heavy metals in, in, uh, nail, in their toenails uh, and other compartments. Um, acrylamide is a, it does a variety of things. It may be a carcinogen, but it also may be a mitochondrial toxin. Right. And so we're interested to say, is there any uh, role there? And so we're just about to send off a whole bunch of samples of new onset IBD in kids mm -hmm. to say, is this increased? And it, there's a thing that's down at the uh, NIH. They have a special test for that. Yeah, I mean, the whole mitochondrial thing is fascinating because, you know, all environmental toxins will become mitochondrial toxins. It's part of how they work. Yeah, yeah. And, and heavy metals in particular do that. And yes. also they bind to enzymes, inhibit, right. you know, gut function in, in different ways. So yeah. it's kind of a multitude of in, impacts of these toxins and how they work. So, and one of the things that we did, so with a, with a colleague at Brigham, he has the zebrafish model of colitis. And what they do is they can put zebrafish, just the, it's only for five days, in 96 well plates. And you can then put in, we, working with the uh, NIH, uh, we had a whole bunch of different potential environmental toxins. And it's roboticized so they can look at the colon through not dissecting each one and looking at it under the microscope, but through, because you can see through them, you can evaluate their colitis on these five-day-old zebrafish. Fish. And looking then to say which of these, we looked at about 100 different environmental toxins, to say which of these are potential toxins. And we have a paper that's coming out, or I don't know if it's coming out, but it's been submitted. So I wouldn't say that much about it, but one of the things that's curious that, that is that there was a, a spill, it may, not have, it may have been in Ohio even, I'm not sure, and as the settlement for the, this toxin spill, they said you've got to do epidemiologic studies. And this was, uh, you probably know the name, I'm forgetting it, PFO octanoic, it's the thing that goes into Teflon. Yeah. And what was interesting is that in the exposure area, there was an increased risk of ulcerative colitis. And so it could even be something as benign as we have these, you know, we cook our eggs, it's easier to clean, you just you know, put it under the water and it's great and you're set. But that toxin that you're getting from your frying pan may potentially be a risk for ulcerative colitis. Fascinating. So um, how, do we, how do we sort of start to diagnose and treat these patients? Because it seems like you've got, you know, one person might be related to the diet microbiome, another person's toxic load. How do you... Yeah. So it's tough because I think it, firstly it says we need to individualize treatment. That we have traditional or let's say standard medications that can be very effective for some people and other people, you know, some people may not want to take the pathway of saying you got to change your diet, you got to do these other things, and it may also be partly effective. I do think that at a certain point these diseases be do become autoimmune and it cycles on itself and you need to do something to interrupt that inflammatory process. But I think for the vast majority of people, they don't need all of that. Mm -hmm. And we can get by with other things. Now, what approach is that? It depends, particularly since we don't know what some of these toxins are. And so it's harder to say uh, what to do. But I would say that certainly uh, changes in diet, some are mild, but some need to be a little bit more radical. And I think starting with a broader change is helpful because I think sometimes people make minor changes yeah. and they get discouraged and then they say, oh, I've done that, I don't want to do that. So, but to get people to embrace it and to, because the, the whole experience with physicians can often be very passive. You come in, say, what should I do? And they say, all right, here are the meds you take. And then they go off and it's, it, they're not, not just getting involved, but really doing these various changes, whether it's sleep, exercise, whether it's changing in diet, whether it's changing different exposures you may have. And so as, as lots of people have pointed out in terms of the diseases I take care of, even if I see somebody numerous times over the course of a year, I may only spend three or four, three or four hours during that whole year with them. So 99% of the time, more, they're taking care of themselves. They're gonna decide are they taking the meds, what supplements they're gonna take, how are they gonna manage their health, all these things. And so it's a matter of getting people to embrace that involvement. So you've done this incredible program at the Brigham called the Circle Program, 
where you have a comprehensive team approach to dealing with all the nutritional, psychological, behavioral, lifestyle issues. Yeah. Right. And, and what was amazing with that program, I love you to talk about, it, is that you showed a significant reduction in hospitalizations, readmissions, ER visits. Yeah, it's been tremendously effective. So this is a program that's that is a broad-based program. So. It's dealing, we have, as far as team members, we have a social worker, we have a stress management program, we have a health educator, uh, we have a psychiatrist, uh, we have a nutritionist, uh, and we're really trying to broaden out what care means. And so we're addressing all of these various issues of nutrition, stress management, and giving people the tools to take care of them themselves. And we were hoping we could bring about a reduction in hospitalizations by 15%. We far exceeded that. Uh, it was, it's really, as we go forward, it's been over 60%. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at ER visits and, and uh, visits otherwise, and patient outcomes are much better. Mm -hmm. So what the hypothesis was that health education alone, each element alone isn't sufficient. It's got to be a more comprehensive program. Mm -hmm. Now, um, how to, what what is the component that needs to work for the, Individual is something that gets worked out between the individual and the team. So it's not that we're saying, this is what you need to do. You need to understand the person. What are their needs? What are their approaches? What is their life? And what is their, and, and then develop a program that works best for them with their input. So we're not, it's, it's, we don't have IBD one, two, three, four, and five and say, which of those models do you fit into? It's more trying to figure out with the person what they need. And it's fascinating because, you know, what you're talking about is, you know, you've got the best IBD docs in the world getting a certain outcome, but when you add this component, you see a 60% improvement in yeah. outcomes, which is enormous. Yeah. And we're seeing the same thing in our Functioning for Life program here at Cleveland Clinic, where yeah. we're getting almost twice the benefit from the groups as the one-on-one -on -one visits, right. which sort of is, you know, contradicts right. our idea <laughs> yeah. that we're so all-knowing so and powerful, right? right? But I think, that, I think it's so interesting, because I think there's also something that's critical about the group. And in our, we have this uh, mind-body program, which is the group, and the group talking to each other, and learning from each other, and getting support from each other. Yeah. And not that there isn't something special about the doctor-patient relationship, but there's something there it's about like I that. I said the group that is medicine. Yes. It's like food is medicine. Exactly. And, and independent of the content, there's something that happens in the dynamic of the social support. And I, yeah. I think we know that social determinants are how far outstrip every other etiology of disease. You right, know? right. So, and people feel so isolated often with these mm -hmm. diseases, and they're spending hours in the bathroom alone. And yeah. when they suddenly realize they're, you know, other people are dealing with this, and how are they dealing with it, and, yeah. and realizing that life can, you know, they can get back on track yeah. and all that. It's fun. So there's, there's one last sort of topic I want to cover, which mm -hmm. is, relates to this, which is the sort of prevalence of depression and anxiety in yeah. IBD. And, you know, I remember in medical school learning that Crohn's and IBD patients uh, were basically psychosomatically driven like that mm -hmm. yes it was a real disease but these the part of the reason was they were all anxious and depressed and stressed and it was sort of a lot of it in their head yeah and it was sort of a pejorative view yeah. i don't know if you learned that but that's certainly what i got from my teachers right and and as we sort of learn more about the microbiome we now know that independent of your you know psychological framework that the microbiome can affect your mood anxiety behavior in ways we never thought possible so the question is you know some of the data show that that you presented show that if you have a pre-existing depression you're more likely to get crohn's right but could it be that it's because the microbiome is is on its way to being disturbed and that it's sort of a gut brain issue as opposed to a brain gut issue yeah so absolutely so we're just beginning to understand this that the pendulum initially was that these were psychosomatic diseases, and, and they went as far as doing lobotomies, uh, which was published in Journal of the American Medical Association in 1956, which is unbelievable. It's not that long ago. <laughs> not that long ago. And, and then it became a fashion for a little bit to do that. Um, we've gotten away from that, but then we got too far away from it, saying these are, are, you know, the mind is not connected at all. And now I think at least it's coming back. So nurses' health study following 120,000 nurses where they get information before the development of any disease. And then they can look back and say what contributed to that. And the onset of depression symptoms was a risk for the subsequent development of Crohn's, not ulcerative colitis. How that is, we don't understand. Um, and there's been a dysbiosis that's now been associated with depression and how consistent that is, and, and is it 
a, some functional impairment of whether it's propionate, whether it's other factors that may contribute, uh, we haven't really figured out by any means. We're in such an early stage in all of this. And I'm sure, you know, you know the slide where the, the curve goes way up and everyone's very enthusiastic and then it goes way down and sort of it's the development of a new idea and then it goes sort of too low and now I think we're, we have to understand really where it fits in and what, make these connections. So it's tough enough to study the dysbiosis in Crohn's, it's tough enough to study it in depression and then to figure out how this fits together mm -hmm. is even more difficult. But, but it, that's, I think it's a really exciting time. I'm hoping we're going to put these puzzle pieces together and figure yeah. this out. Well, it makes sense, right? If you've got an enteric nervous system that's constantly feeding back to the brain and you're having inflammation and activation of, you know, cytokines and, and, uh, and the, you know, neural pathways that irritate the brain, you get sort of an irritable bowel causes an irritable brain, not the other way around, maybe. Yes. I mean, I think the issue is that we see things so compartmentalized yeah. in our bodies that we, we see that as miles away and not necessarily connected, but really figuring out how they fit together is, is a challenge because why it is then in Crohn's but not ulcerative colitis mm -hmm. is also a curious thing. You think yeah. it's a, it's, this is an amazing conversation. It sort of makes us realize that just when we thought we knew something, we don't really know right. anything. <laughs> yeah. And we're really at a whole new frontier of understanding right. the gut, the microbiome, on, on all the digestive disorders that I think are going to lead to sort of radical changes in our approach that incorporate these multimodal therapies that incorporate different ideologies that we have to address and are, are really personalizing medicine. And it's yeah. sort of an exciting moment. It's just great to have you yeah. and talk to our community and, and uh, hope wonderful. To hear thank more you. From this you. is great. Thank you. All right. I really appreciate it. All right. Wonderful. All right. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thank you.